Welcome, everyone, to this Good Leadership Podcast. My name is Charles Good, your host and the president of the Institute for Management Studies. This podcast is designed to provide you with actionable insights and tools that you can use from discussing the research, stories, and background from recognized experts and practitioners to accelerate your impact in your current role. My goal is what we've discussed today will be immediately actionable and useful to you, and I'd love to hear your comments for this episode about what you're planning on implementing. I'm so happy today to be joined by Chester Elton, who is the number one New York Times bestselling business author, organizational culture guru, employee engagement and leadership expert. He is one of today's most influential voices in workplace trends. Chester spent the last two decades helping clients engage their employees to execute on strategy, vision, and values. He is also the co-author of multiple award-winning bestselling leadership books, including All In, The Carrot Principle, Leading with Gratitude, and anxiety at work. His books have been translated into more than 30 languages and have sold close to 2 million copies worldwide. Thank you so much for joining me today, Chester. It's a privilege to have you on the show. No, thanks for the invitation, Charles. I'm pleased to be with you today. Love to start off each episode just talking about a little bit about your background. What got you interested in this field and the data and the research? And it's such a, a great research study and such a large study that you kind of uh, use to build these insights for your books. Um, so I'd love for you to kind of unpack that a little bit, talk about your background and what really your, made you passionate about this field of study. Sure. Well, you know, as you and I have talked, the first thing you need to know is that uh, I grew up in Canada and therefore I am a diehard hockey fan. <laughs> My team is the New Jersey Devils and we are really good right now, which has been a long time coming. So let's get that out of the way. You know, my co-author, Adrian Gostick, and I, we've been studying workplace, you know, culture, leadership teams for just over 20 years now. And it's been really interesting that one of the reasons that we got into it is, like you and I'm sure most everybody that's listening to the podcast, we've had jobs where the alarm clock went off and the last thing you wanted to do was go to work. You know, the culture was toxic. You didn't feel like your boss supported you. You didn't feel like your work was valued or recognized and, and, and so on and so on. So you contrast that to the really good jobs you've had, you know, where you loved working for your manager, where you thought you were making a difference and, and how that didn't just impact your work and the innovation you brought to work and the energy you brought to work into your customers, the ripple effect it had on you and your family and your community. So that's what really intrigued us. And I'll tell you that what was interesting, we started our research in and around uh, recognition. You know, my favorite color is orange because the first seven books that Adrian and I wrote had carrot in the title, you know. It's all about more carrots, less sticks, right? More recognition, less less punishment, you know, the, a culture of gratitude. And as we started to then migrate in, into great cultures and great leaders and great teams, that common thread was always there. That, that was a key element of great leaders was that they expressed gratitude and they did it as, in a certain way and people felt valued. So it's been a wonderful journey of, of research. You know, we have a database of over a million engagement surveys that showed us that human side of business, that human contact, that need to be valued and appreciated was really key to all those great elements that leads us back to, and when the alarm clock goes off, you're pretty excited to go to work. And, you know, that's that's a gift. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. And that's so important to have that great culture at work. And, and really, it started with that kind of the carrot principle. And I'd love for you to go in a little bit about building the carrot culture at work. What is that? And then maybe we can transition into employee engagement. Yeah, well, actually, what we found is the, the number one driver of employee engagement was gratitude. It was the carrot. That when I believed what I did mattered, that I made a difference and it was noticed and celebrated, everything got better. I mean, your return on equity got better. Retention got better. Customer loyalty got better, but customer engagement got better. And all, all those metrics that we're looking at now as you're looking at the, the tumult that we just came through, through the virus and political unrest and wars and rumors of wars, as they say in the Bible. So, you, you know, as you, as you go through that, you take a look and say, wow, is it that simple that if we value and appreciate our employees, that we can impact all those indexes? And actually, it was quite delightful to find out that, yeah, that is the case. I'll tell you the pushback we got, though, Charles, which was always interesting, is 
those kind of leadership skills are seen as soft skills and nice to haves, not, you know, hard skills and must haves. Well, I think the pandemic really turned upside down was, is that the leaders that had the best soft skills got the best results. Because more than ever in all that uncertainty, we needed reassurance that what we did mattered, that we were important, that we had a future at work. And no better way to reinforce all that than simple expressions of, of gratitude. Our first big research study was the carrot principle. We did it with Willis Towers Watson. It was a global study. We looked at all the major economic centers in the world. And we found that the three most common elements of engagement was I had an opportunity to learn and grow. I had trust in the organization. I trusted my leaders. I trusted my company. I trusted our mission and values. And a really interesting one is I was proud of the company symbol. In other words, I was proud to tell people where I worked. Well, as we looked at those three, and they were universal, whether it was Asia or Africa, East, Western Europe, North and South America, is we said, that's really interesting. What are the drivers of the drivers? The number one driver of trust was communication. The number one driver of pride in the organization was we kept our promises. But the number one driver of the number one driver, which is I had a place to grow and develop, was gratitude. And by the way, it was the number two driver of trust and pride in the organization. So again, we come back to the best leaders. And I'm sure you could look at your career and say, you know, the leaders that I really loved working for were people that appreciated my work and made me feel really good about what I'm doing. So that was our first big affirmation. And gosh, that was back in, you know, 2007, 2009. And now fast forward to 2022, those principles are even more important. In fact, we we did kind of a, a, a redo of the care principle in our book called Leading with Gratitude and found that all these years later, those elements are are still there still the bedrock of great cultures and great leaders. Kind of fun, huh? That's great to hear. And do you find that post-virus, and maybe we're not post-virus, but <laughs> coming out of this pandemic to whatever extent we are, do you see that leaders and we are more grateful, kind, and patient? Has that increased these attributes? Or are we moving in the wrong direction? You know, such a great question, because you say, well, if it's so obvious, are more people doing it? Uh, unfortunately, no. <laughs> You know, the good leaders do. The good leaders get it. You know, um, leaders that haven't been coached up, that, that haven't had good mentors, you know, panic sets in pretty quickly. And we go back to the, hey, I got to check the boxes. I'm doing more with less. I've got to hit my quotas and I don't care who I kill to get there because all that really matters is the output. Well, one of the things that the pandemic really showed us was that you can get tremendous output doing work in a lot of different ways. You know, it's so interesting uh, dealing with a company out of Virginia and they just built these beautiful new headquarters, you know, like cool offices, rocket fast Wi-Fi, you know, snacks and treats and game rooms and what everything you can imagine. And the pandemic hits and they can't use it. Well, fast forward 18 months later, you know, the CEO says, hey, well, come on, everybody, come on back to work. I mean, it'll be so much more fun. It'll be so much more productive. When the, the head of HR said, I don't know if you've noticed, we've, we've had the best 18 months in the history of the company with letting people have a more flexible schedule and work from home. So while, yeah, sure, come on back if you, if you feel like it, let's not get crazy here. You know, this formula is working. And so the ability for leaders to adjust and to be flexible, you know, the war for talent is over and talent won. <laughs> so this idea that, you know, flexible workplaces, that's the new currency. And if you really want to attract and retain that top talent, you've got to lead with more gratitude. You've got to lead with more empathy, more flexibility. And the companies that did that really well during the pandemic, they didn't just survive. They thrived. They flourished. And it was really a great lesson, I think. Yes. Um, and I've seen it a lot with companies. And, and there's a distinction I like to kind of Kind of break down or go into because I've heard this from other leaders as well. The difference between recognition and appreciation because no one feels like they're over appreciated. I have never met anyone that says, you know what, I'm just too appreciated at this job. And and really, how I distinguish it is appreciation is really just valuing the person for who they are. Recognition you need to moderate. It needs to be 
done in the right manner for the right types of things so that it holds the necessary weight. But many leaders, I feel, kind of put these two together and say, well, you know, I'm just not going to recognize slash appreciate them because there's nothing to recognize them for. Well, but there's always a frequent need to appreciate your employees for who they are and what they bring to the table. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think you're spot on. You know, when we think of recognition, we think of the more formal attributes, like, you know, the red carpet, the big dinner, the plaque, right. the watch, whatever, you know, appreciation. And, and we interpret appreciation as gratitude or those day-to-day -day things, you know, usually cost you nothing, right? A, a few minutes of your time at, at most. And those are then become part of your daily rituals, your daily traditions. We've been uh, experimenting a lot with this lately at wonderful company up in Canada called FYI Doctors. And they have bought up a bunch of optometrist uh, businesses and they've grouped them all together. And they have a wonderful ritual they call 10 and 10. And they stick, they take, you know, they've got lots of optometrist stores and, and they're, they're doctors and so on. And they, they start every day for 10 minutes, just, hey, welcoming people to work, talking about the day, thanking them for showing up and, and, and bringing a great attitude. And then at the end of the day, wrapping it up and thanking them for another hard day's work and uh, for their efforts and, and checking off all the things that went right. And you say, well, isn't that kind of contrived? And you go, absolutely. <laughs> you know? and, and the more they did it, the more it became a tradition and not just something they did. It became who they, who they are with that culture of gratitude and appreciating each other. So I agree with you hundred percent. Recognition can often be, you know, the ceremony and the stuff, whereas gratitude and appreciation, that's more the culture. That's more the emotional engagement that you're really looking for in, in great, in great companies and great cultures. And there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And many leaders really haven't been trained on how to give it sincerely. And you give some tips regarding that, that I'd love for you to kind of share with our audience to help them to be more effective when they give gratitude. Yeah. Yeah. We say, do it now, do it often, be specific and be sincere, you know? So you do it now, you know, they, oh, I'll remember later in the team meeting or maybe at the end of the quarter, certainly at the end of the year, you know, we have our year end bank. And of course you don't, you get caught up in stuff. I mean, we're humans, we're easily distracted, you know? And so we, we say, look, do it now. Plus, you know, from your, you know, psychology one-on-one class in, in university, Primacy, recency. The closer the gratitude is to the behavior, the more likely it is to be repeated. You know, I, I often like to use the example of the uh, the Super Bowl celebration for the coach. It's the Gatorade bath. But th this idea that, you know, if you were to see the coach two weeks later at the mall with his family and all of a sudden uh, unleashed a turn of Gatorade on him, it would have little to no effect. It would be embarrassing, right? At the end of the game, though, that's where it's meaningful. You know, you get your gold medal right when the when the game is over. So do it now becomes really, really important. The do it often is where we get a lot of pushback. And, and like you say, Charles, I, I loved your example where you said, how many times at the end of the day have you gone home to your family and said, man, I got way too much appreciation today. <laughs> you know, so they're bringing me cakes and balloons and flax. And, you know, here's a couple of tickets to Hawaii. You know, I couldn't get anything done. I definitely have to work from home tomorrow. You look at all the surveys, you know, Gallup has uh, done wonderful surveys and Deloitte and go on and on, Willis Towers Watson. If you look at, uh, was I recognized in the last seven days by my manager? It's almost always near the bottom. So, you know, yes, do it often. Now, to your earlier point, which was very insightful, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. You know, you say, oh, yeah, I give lots of recognition, you know. Uh, every day I come in and go, hey, great job, great job, great job. Charles, you're killing it, man. You are the best. You are the Tower of Pisa. <laughs> you know, well, you know, one of the things we coach leaders up on is general praise has no impact. And specificity has great impact, you know, which is the third one, right? Do it now, do it often, be specific. Don't just say, hey, you're doing great, champ. You know, I just love having your hair. You know, <laughs> it just doesn't mean anything. So what what is it that I did so I can replicate that behavior again? Hey, I love what you did with that customer. You, they came in, they were pretty upset. You explained the warranty that we'd replace the product, you know, whatever the situation might be. And they left, you know, skipping and laughing. They'll be a customer for life. That's what we mean by extraordinary customer service. Well, I'm going to do that again. No, no doubt about it. And then the sincerity piece, you know, we've all had bosses, right? Where clearly HR called them and said, hey, 
you got to be nicer. <laughs> and so all of a sudden they brought donuts or all of a sudden everybody's work was spectacular and you just knew that they didn't mean it, right? The specificity gives you great credibility. Specificity gives you that genuine factor. And, and even though leaders don't do it maybe very well to begin with, the more they do it, the better they'll get. You know, practice is 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 key. So don't worry if you don't get it right right away. Keep doing it. The more you do it, the better you get. So I really appreciate that question and my long rambling answer here. <laughs> to do it now, do it often, be specific and be sincere. And I hope that was helpful. Very much so. And I find that to be the case as well, especially with the sincerity piece, is always assume positive intent because it makes it sound more sincere. And this is not a habit that many leaders have built up in their skill set. So it's finding ways to do it every day. And you give a great example of Carlos Aguilar on just a simple daily practice or routine that I'd love for you to just unpack for our listeners, just so that that's just a one idea, one example that they can take and say, that's a great idea. Maybe I can incorporate something similar in my workplace. Well, you touch on a great point there, Charles, that certain rituals can be really impactful. Carlos Aguilar is a wonderful leader in Dallas, Texas for Avis Budget Rental Car. His story is wonderful in the sense that it was an awakening for him. When he first became a leader, they did a 360 on him. And he's a new manager, right? Didn't have a lot of mentoring, didn't have a lot of training. The people that he managed called him a seagull manager, which meant that he'd fly in and crap all over everything and then fly away. <laughs> Not a great leadership brand, right? Had, had a, a mentor that took him under his wing and said, look, Carlos, you're really good about pointing out what's going wrong. You're not as good about pointing out what's going right. And lots of good things happen every day to keep the doors open. So why don't you figure out a way to take note of the, all the good things? So he developed a personal ritual where he puts 10 coins in his left pocket. And he sets a goal to have 10 positive interactions with his people every day. And the way he keeps track is he moves a coin from his left pocket to his right pocket. We were interviewing him for one of our books and it was noon and he said, guys, uh, come with me. I, I've still got eight coins in my left pocket. <laughs> I'm running out of time. I'm not doing my job. And, and as we talked to him, he said, you know, I can't always be with my people, but I can text them. I can phone them. I can write them a note. I can, you know, copy them on a blast email to all their peers and, and, and you know, the skip level leaders and really highlight their good work. Well, as you can imagine, it didn't take very long that when he did his next 360, he wasn't the seagull manager anymore. He was a great leader that people loved working for. His turnover rates were down. His, you know, his profitability was up. Customer satisfaction was up. And what, what I love about Carlos is he took it home. You know, he said, these are great practices. And I would be a fool if I did all this good work at work and left it there. And so he takes it home. And, and it's a great challenge, you know. Uh, he found out through a Harvard study that the ratio of a, a positive culture is five compliments to every criticism, five to one. He said, I, I, what's my ratio with my wife? What's my ratio with my kids? What's my ratio with my neighbors? And that's the ripple effect of gratitude that I just so enjoy. You know, that it goes far beyond work if if you let it, if you let it. Love that story. And I've incorporated something similar to that. I find myself and I'm probably not the only one that has kind of a negativity bias that really kind of looks for the uh, glass half empty instead of half full. So it's a great daily practice to incorporate, to build more gratitude and the profound impacts it can have not only on your company, but also in your family and the most important people in your life. Now, what would you say to those individuals to say, okay, how is gratitude more than being nice? How can you stay demanding while also be grateful? Love for you to talk, you know, just unpack a little bit of the story about Alan Mulally, how he's perceived as both, right? So you can have both. Oh, absolutely. It's not just Alan Mulally, you know, at the Ford Motor Company. What one of my heroes, by the way, if you want to read a great book, American Icon, how Alan Mulally saved the Ford Motor Company. You know, you've got Gary Ridge at WD40, who recently retired, who, you know, leads with tremendous amount of gratitude and, and gets extraordinary results. Ken Chenault, we got to talk to Ken Chenault, the CEO of American Express. I mentioned these three, uh, along with Indra Noe, by the way, who just had just retired from Pepsi. These are leaders that got extraordinary results. And if you were ever to say to any money that had worked for them or knew their stories, yeah, but that gratitude thing, didn't it make them kind of soft? Didn't it? Wasn't it easier for people to take advantage of them? 
oh, guess again. <laughs> you know, you, you, you know from the story of Ellen Mullally that they described Ellen Mullally with a, a spine of titanium. I mean, he got results. He was very demanding and had very rigid rituals and so on and, and reporting structures and so on. And yet people loved working for him because when you hit those numbers and he would help you get there, he never failed to celebrate. In fact, one of our great endorsements of our book, Leading with Gratitude, is Ellen. He said, I love, love, love this book. And he left us a wonderful voicemail. He said, you know, I have always, whether it was at Boeing or Ford or my family, which I love, we have always led with gratitude. So yeah, no, listen, you can be tremendously demanding. And think about your personal life. Maybe those teachers that really pushed you, a coach that pushed you, you know, a, a parent. Was there, of course you wanted to perform. Was there ever any doubt that they were cheering for you? That they cared about you? No. And in fact, we love them more because they pushed us and they made us better. You're absolutely right. And and that's and that myth, I think, you know, I'd love to dispel it from everyone's mindset that you can't have both because you can be incredibly demanding, but also be very grateful and the and the results speak for itself. Before we end this episode, I love the story you had stated, either it may have been in one of your books or other podcasts, but just the impact that a company can have when it does it right. When it looks at at this gratitude of taking care of its employees, that's going to impact in a positive way the customers and the community around it. And you talk about Texas Roadhouse, which I think many people are familiar <laughs> with, but what they did during the pandemic that really differentiated their brand. Just extraordinary, you know, and and that wasn't a fluke, by the way. They they had 20 years of building that culture. You know, Ken Taylor, one of the great iconic leaders, I think, of our generation, always put the roadies first. You, know, you work at Texas Roadhouse, you're a roadie. Because he worked at places where he worked really hard and had tremendous results and never got credit for it. And he kind of vowed to himself that he, he would never lead that way. So he already had the trust of his roadies. And so when the pandemic hit, now you got to understand the Texas Roadhouse, I mean, their whole experience is party, party in, the, in the restaurant. You come in, there's music and the smells and the line dancing and the peanuts on the floor and all that good stuff, right? So when the pandemic hit and all of a sudden you couldn't go into the restaurant, it was kind of like, well, wait a minute. That literally was 95% of their revenue. Only about 5% was takeout. So he got all his leaders together and he said, look, we got to figure this out. What do we do? So it was a party in the parking lot. <laughs> they figured it out. And, and, and his mission, he, he figured out really quickly that all of a sudden, all kinds of people were out of work. Yeah, they were going to get some unemployment and some subsidies and so on. But how are you going to feed your families? And so they had these, these family packages for like $20, $30. And, and it was, you know, if you've ever eaten at Texas Roadhouse, great food. And the rolls are crazy good, you know. And, and they put these packages together. You could feed a family of five, a family of seven for like $30. And he said, our mission isn't just to stay in business. It's to feed America. You know, let's take care of each other. And well, when he got all these leaders together and these crazy ideas were flying around and they try them all. You know, they, they had a farmer's market at one of their places in, in North Carolina. And <laughs> the highway patrol guys at the local police department said, you got to let us know when you're doing this because it's we're having like five mile backups into the highway. And they invited like the local florist, you know, to come in. And the, uh, it was it was so ingenious because it was service with a heart six feet apart. They, yeah. And who doesn't want to give their money and their loyalty to a company that says, we're in this together. It's as a community. Yeah, we're going to make a little bit of money. We're going to stay in business. And we're going to stay in the business in a way that's going to keep your family fed, going to keep you happy. And when you come through that parking lot, we're going to have a little bit of a laugh together. Yeah, Ken Taylor, I, I, I can't tell you enough about when you've got, and, and demanding, oh my gosh, are you kidding I mean, and an and example of fight it in everything he did. He visited the stores. He talked to his cooks. He talks to his to his service. He talked to the bartenders. He got into the communities. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you brought him up. I haven't talked about Kent for a while, and uh, he's iconic. They'll they'll never be another Kent Taylor. Well, leading with gratitude, treating your employees the right way, the 
restaurant industry during the pandemic lost millions. But as far as I know, Texas Roadhouse did its best to lose very little, if any, as he took care of his employees. You know, and I'm glad you brought that up because this missing part of the story I just told. What was it like 50 million? Or, I, that number's probably high, but it was in the millions of restaurant workers lost their jobs. Not one of them worked for Texas Roadhouse. Not one. And if they didn't feel safe coming to work because they had aging parents or they had compromised spouses, he paid. They never took a dollar of, of government bailout money. And you know who was his inspiration for all of that? Alan Mulally. Wow. He got to spend some time with Alan Mulally in our leadership group. And when it hit, he goes, hey, we don't need their money. We can do this. You know, that we're innovative. We're in this to win it. We care about each other. We're going to support each other. And I'm telling you, when people got the chance to come back to work, the stories were great. They'd welcome them back. They'd throw a party, you know. And he said, people literally broke down and cried. They said, we, we, we missed being at work so much. We've missed you guys. Now it's safe. We've got our mask. My parents are in good shape. Can't tell you what it means to me to come back and work, to earn all that money you've been paying me to stay home. I mean, the loyalty factor, just ridiculous. Just ridiculous. Now, you, you want a case study, uh, you should read Made from Scratch. It's Kent Taylor's story of the improbable success of Texas Roadhouse. Adrian and I helped them write it, and we wrote it through the pandemic. All the things they did during the pandemic, it, it's, it's, it's a roadmap on how to handle a crisis. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to reading that. And that's such a powerful and inspirational story for all organizations on really how effective a leader can be if he leads with the right values. Absolutely. Before we end this episode, just wanted to leave our listeners with maybe one or two simple practices that they could all do to flex their gratitude muscle on a more frequent basis from the guru of gratitude. <laughs> there you go, the apostle. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, you know, I develop your own personal little rituals. You know, I've got a fun one. I, I carry around these little gratitude stones in my pocket. And I just look for, for people that are doing a great job, whether, whether it's the waitress at the diner, the guy at the car wash, you know. And I'll tell you, it's really interesting. I, I always love to say, uh, I was at a hockey game the other day. It was a cold night. And you've got all the police officers that are holding the traffic so the fans don't get run over. I mean, it is Jersey, right? And uh, I said, you know, officer, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate it. I come to the Rock all the time. And uh, you always keep us safe. So I've got a little token of gratitude for you. You know, it's a little gratitude stone. And you think, yeah. Charles, I was giving him a, a Fabergé egg, right? <laughs> and I said, you know, it's a stone because when you throw a stone in the pond, the water ripples just like gratitude. So whether it's you're writing three thank you notes a week, or you, you give a, a little gratitude stone, or you have a morning text that you send out to your people with a little positive affirmation, develop a little ritual and stick to it. You know, my mantra every time I get up in the morning is be kind, be grateful, and be of service. Because I know if I can be in that mindset, I'm going to have a good day. Develop your own little rituals, and then find a family ritual that you enjoy. My wife and I have a great ritual at the end of every day. We say, what are your three? Give me three things you're grateful for. And as you might guess, it's often many more than three. Because it causes you to reflect. And studies have shown that people that end their day in gratitude, they sleep a little better, they have a little deeper relationships, and their burdens are just a little lighter. So figure out a ritual to start your day and a ritual to end your day. A gratitude stone, thank you note, what are your three are some that I hope. And by the way, we've got a ritual you should adopt Twice a month, we have a, a newsletter on LinkedIn called The Gratitude Journal with all these fun practices. It's free. And we would love you to subscribe. We love the ripple effect of gratitude. I hope that wasn't too salesy there at the end. No, no. Thank you, Chester. I um, so appreciate that. Remind our listeners other ways in which they can reach out and, and get in contact with you. Yeah, the, uh, thecultureworks.com. You know, that's our website. Adrian's got a wonderful practice. He writes a weekly article for Forbes.com and LinkedIn. Between thecultureworks.com, LinkedIn, and Adrian's Forbes articles, you can you can find pretty much everything we're doing. Thank you so much for joining me today, Chester. Such a pleasure. You got it. This concludes this episode of the Good Leadership Podcast. You can send us your feedback at info at ims-online.com. If you'd like to subscribe, this podcast can be found both on Apple and Spotify. and can also be accessed on the Institute for Management Studies website at ims-online.com. Until next time, remember, it's not what you know, but what you do consistently that makes a difference. Mm -hmm.